Well, it's good to see all of you here. I always like to visit the Austin chapter. A wonderful group here. Hey, I'm going to be sharing uh, a couple of stories, but it's uh, based on a principle we have at Reasons to Believe. All of you are probably aware we're a science apologetics organization. What we do is we take the latest discoveries in God's book of nature and use that as a bridge to bring people to the book of scripture and into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. So on that basis, we're selective about our apologetics. There's a lot of science apologetics we don't touch. We focus on the science apologetics that we have found is most effective in bringing people to faith in Jesus Christ, particularly people who don't have a Christian background and have not been previously exposed to the Bible. So I picked a couple of stories, uh, one uh, a little longer, one very short, that kind of demonstrates that. But it's all based on this Bible passage you see in 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give an answer for everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, when we first launched Reasons to Believe 36 years ago, uh, surveys showed that about 20% of adults who attend church every week would share their faith with a non-Christian somewhere within that year. That percentage is now 5%. And so the passion I have in my later years, what can we do to bring that percentage from 5% back up to 20%? I like to see it go to 90%. I mean, after all, Christ gave us a mission. He said, I will return when you who are my followers take the good news of salvation to all the people groups of the world and make all these people groups disciples of Jesus Christ. And as I put uh, down in my book, uh, Improbable Planet, uh, we Christians already have the resources, the finances, the people, the technology. We could take care of that in just 10 years, but we lack the motivation. So hopefully what I share with you today will help you uh, to be motivated, but more than that, help you to motivate others to join you in always being ready. Now, one reason we focus so much on developing reasons from God's book of nature is I've discovered that the number one reason why Christians do not share their faith, they don't feel that they're prepared. And hey, if you don't have adequate preparation, you're not gonna have the confidence you need uh, to boldly share your faith. And so we've been focusing on that preparation. But it's also important that we deliver with gentleness and respect. And I've been giving talks on how you do that. And one of the best ways of doing that is share your faith. Because when you share your faith, you'll quickly find out those areas where you're not being gentle and respectful. I have found that non-Christians are quite eager to tell you where you're not gentle and respectful. <laughs> and if you have any doubts, just ask them. Hey, was any place in what I shared with you today that you would interpret as being obnoxious? And again, I find that they're quite eager to tell you. And uh, I've been doing that for decades, and that's how you build the gentleness and respect. And again, I run into Christians who say, you know what, I don't think I can do a good job. Well, if God was worried about you doing a really good job, he would have sent the angels. But what I find interesting, he told the angels, sit down. I'm not going to use you. You can help these uh, human beings, but I'm going to use them as my primary instrument. Wow. Why? Because as we share our faith, we become spiritually transformed. So sharing your faith is just as much for you. You see that in Philemon chapter 6, where Paul says to Philemon, I pray that you'll be active in sharing your faith so that you'll come to a knowledge of every good thing. Because when you share your faith, you figure, okay, you know what? I need to develop better reasons. And this is how you really grow in the knowledge of what God wants to share with you. Okay, let me jump into the first story. And it begins when I'm in the San Francisco airport. And you know how it is, especially with this pandemic. Flights get delayed. And I, I like the way the airlines do it. Every 15 minutes they tell you the flight's going to be delayed another 15 minutes. They don't want you walking away to another airline. So they keep telling you, 15 more minutes fit, but this went on and on and on. It was a couple of hours. And then finally they called my name and I said, this is not good news, I got a cheap ticket. 
they're probably going to bump me and I need to be in this place uh, by that day. But I got to the front desk and they said, it looks like you're traveling alone. I said, that's correct. They said, we have a family that needs to sit together. Are you okay if we give you a different seat? I said, yeah, you can put me anywhere you want in the airplane. So they gave me a ticket, but it was for a first class seat. So I said, hey, I get to find out what first class is like. So that was fun. Uh, but I get to my first class seat and uh, a gentleman steps in beside me and he immediately introduces himself. And that's kind of rare. I mean, he said, okay, he says, I'm from Germany, I'm a quantum physicist, and I'm an atheist. <laughs> now, you would never catch American doing that. But I found out that that's very common amongst German academics that they would do that. So, uh, and I'd run into that before, so I said, well, uh, I'm not German. I live in the U.S., but I'm actually Canadian. And I said, I'm not a quantum physicist, I'm an astrophysicist. I'm not an atheist, I'm a Christian. And he looked at me and said, this is going to be a really interesting flight. <laughs> Do you mind if I ask you uh, some questions? And so uh, he began to ask me uh, questions. And in the course of about two hours, he asked me eight questions about the universe. And he said, this is his first question. He says, okay, if there is a God and he wanted life on planet Earth, then why all these other galaxies? Why all this dark matter? Why dark energy? Why does the universe have to be so incredibly uh, massive? And I said, well, you're a quantum physicist. I imagine you've taken courses in quantum chemistry. And he said, yes, I have. And I said, well, the universe's mass determines the makeup of elements in the universe. And uh, the principle is fairly straightforward. I mean, the universe starts off infinitesimally small and nearly infinitely hot. And as it expands, laws of thermodynamics tell us it gets colder and colder. And there's about a 20 second window where the universe passes between the temperature of about 150 billion degrees centigrade and 17 billion degrees centigrade. I won't go into the technical details, but that's the temperature range where nuclear fusion occurs. And this is where the universe begins with nothing but hydrogen, uh, but in that 20 second window, about one quarter of the hydrogen gets fused into helium. And then the, the future stars uh, make everything else. But I said, how quickly the universe passes through that temperature window depends on the total mass of the universe. And so, for example, uh, if you were to uh, make the universe slightly less massive than what it is, the universe would expand so rapidly through the temperature window that you get much less than a quarter of the hydrogen being fused into helium. In fact, you get so little uh, that the future stars would not be able to make any elements beyond hydrogen and helium. So you'd only have two elements in the periodic table. This is what the periodic table would look like, okay? <laughs> now, for those of you who have taken chemistry, this would really make passing your chemistry class a lot easier, okay? Uh, and he said, well, what happens if you make the universe more massive than what it is? And he says, well, then the universe spends so much time going through the temperature window uh, that you get a lot of hydrogen being infused into helium. And then when the first stars form, they quickly convert all the hydrogen and helium in the universe into elements that are as heavy as iron or heavier. I said, you're a chemist. Notice what happens in both situations. You wind up with a universe with no carbon, no oxygen, no nitrogen, no phosphorus, and no possibility for life. So in order to get the periodic table that we have, it's crucial that the mass of the universe be fine-tuned to a great degree. He said, well, can you tell me how much you have to fine-tune it? And I said, well, if it wasn't for dark energy being the dominant component of the universe, I introduced that and said, if you do have a universe with dark energy, the fine-tuning is actually greater. But let's just assume it's all done uh, by mass and gravity. Uh, then you'd have to fine-tune the mass of the universe to better than one part in one quadrillion, 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 quadrillion. 
And he said, well, that's pretty remarkable. And he said, uh, is there any other reasons why the universe's mass has to be fine-tuned? I said, yeah, there's a lot. But the other one I gave him was this one. And uh, it's a fairly straightforward one. You don't have to know anything about nuclear uh, physics for this one. If the universe is slightly less massive than what it is, then gravity is not going to be able to slow down that cosmic expansion for quite very much. The universe will expand so rapidly that gravity will never be able to collect any of the cosmic gas to make galaxies, stars, and planets. The universe will be forever nothing but dispersed gas. And with that kind of a universe, there's no life. He said, well, what's, what about the flip side? He so said, the flip side is this. If you make the universe a little bit more massive, then gravity is going to so efficiently grab that cosmic primordial gas and make massive stars that very quickly you end up with a universe that looks like this. Nothing but black holes and neutron stars. And even the least dense neutron star has a density that exceeds 2 billion tons per level teaspoonful. Now, some of you were grabbing coffee over there. Can you imagine having a cup of coffee? You take a teaspoon, teaspoon worth of a neutron uh, star material, uh, dump it in your coffee, 2 billion tons. Okay? That's a density that's so extreme, you get no molecules, you get no atoms, and there's no possibility for life. So once again, the mass has to be extraordinarily fine-tuned to get a universe where you've got galaxies, stars, and planets. So the cosmic mass density, or even the tiniest fraction greater or smaller, and by tiny I mean one part in a quadrillion, 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 no life would be found anytime, anywhere in the universe. And I heard John saying, uh, you know, that sometimes people like are a fly on the wall. We were having this conversation. The two people behind us were intently listening to everything we were saying. So. And you always kind of know that when they kind of stand up and lean over. So, um, they says, okay, my second question is this. Why is the universe so old? It says, I mean, we're looking at 13.79 billion years for the age of the universe. If God's in control of all this, couldn't he have done it a lot faster? Or maybe he's really enjoying himself. Why wouldn't he take longer to do it all? So, I explained to him, first of all, that... God introduced us human beings in the history of the universe at 13.79 billion years after the cosmic creation event because one reason is because that's the one time where observers, human observers, can look out into the universe and see the entire history of the universe all the way back to the cosmic creation event. And he knew this, but I knew people were listening, so I was explaining. <coughs> that in astronomy, we have no access to the present. And by the way, this works well in our marriage because I keep telling my wife, because I'm an astronomer, I cannot be held responsible for anything happening in the present. <laughs> All of my data comes from the past. That's because of the velocity of light. So when we look at the sun, we don't see the sun as it is now. We see it as it was eight and a quarter minutes ago because that's how long it took the light to reach us. And the farther away we observe, the farther back in time we see. But I said, if God were to place us here five billion years earlier in the history of the universe than he has, then light from the very beginning of creation would not have adequate time to travel on the space surface of the universe and reach our telescopes. So if we were created, say, 10 billion years after the cosmic creation event, we astronomers would only be able to see back two-thirds of the history of the universe. We would have no access or information about the cosmic creation event. And it's the fact that we have access to the cosmic creation event that gives us the most compelling astrophysical evidence that there's a God beyond space and time that created everything. And he kind of jumped in and said, you're not saying we could actually witness the very moment of creation. I said, yeah, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but here's how close we can get. By direct observations, we can see the state of the universe when it was one hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. And he kind of laughed and said, well, that's pretty close to the beginning. <laughs> it is. 
But I said, and he said, well, what happens if we are be here a little bit later? So, you know, what if your God put us here five billion years in the future? I said, well, as we look back towards the cosmic creation event, 13.79 billion light years away, we're seeing bodies in the universe moving with respect to us because of the increasing expansion of the universe at barely under the velocity of light. So it won't be long before the cosmic creation event is moving away from us at greater than the velocity of light, which means we'll no longer be able to see it. So we get the same thing. If God were to put us here five billion years in the future, again, we'd only be seeing the last two-thirds of the history of the universe. We are here at the only time in cosmic history where we can read the whole book of nature from the present all the way back to the very beginning of the universe. So if we were created earlier or later, we'd be unable to witness the cosmic creation event and be unaware of the most compelling evidence scientifically uh, that you need a God beyond space and time. Now, he said, are there any other reasons why uh, God would want to wait 13.79 billion years? I said, well, one reason is uranium and thorium. He says, uranium and thorium are long-lived radioisotopes. And uh, they come exclusively from supernova eruptions and neutron star merging events. That's the only source of uranium and thorium in the universe. And I said, when the universe is young, you've got a lot more supernova explosions taking place than now. As the universe gets older and older, that eruption rate goes down. And also, we see that uranium and thorium do decay away, which means there's going to be a point in the history of the universe where the abundance of uranium and thorium hits a maximum level. And again, just some background here. You need uranium and thorium because uranium and thorium in the interior of the Earth produces the heat that drives the plate tectonics that makes continents possible. It's one of the major heat sources. And it's also one of the major heat sources that provides the energy to establish a long-lasting strong magnetic field, which produces a magnetosphere, which protects us from deadly radiation. I mean, Elon Musk might want to go to Mars. I don't want to go to Mars. <laughs> Because on Mars, there's no magnetosphere. And without a magnetosphere, uh, your intestinal tract will be destroyed in about three months. So, uh, yeah, so if somebody wants to sign you up for Mars, I encourage you to turn them down. Okay. Uh, but when we look at uranium and thorium in the universe, we see that it hits a peak abundance in the history of the universe when the universe is slightly more than 9 billion years old. So today, the uranium and thorium is decaying away, and the uh, frequency of supernova eruptions is also decaying away. And he says, well, okay, then why didn't God uh, put us here four and a half billion years ago? And I said, well, there's another issue here. You're dealing with stars, and stars are a lot like human beings. They're unstable when they're young, they're unstable when they're old. They're maximally stable when they're middle-aged. But it says, the big difference is, with humans, the stability period is about 90% of your lifespan. Some of us only 80%, but some 90%, okay? So with stars, it's a tiny fraction of a percent. So with stars, for example, and by the way, of all the stars in the universe, we're orbiting the most stable star in the entire universe that we can detect. Okay. Uh, and this is the situation for the history of our star, the Sun. Namely, that its flaring activity was extreme when it was young. It's now hit a minimum, and in the future, it's going to again rise up towards that extreme. And it's not just solar flaring activity. This is the same graph you would get for X-ray radiation and short ultraviolet radiation. And the scale here is logarithmic. So we see here as a level that's 100,000 times greater than what it is right here. Now, you can have God creating microbes here, because microbes can handle a lot of nasty radiation. We humans can't. The only window that we can exist is right here. And in fact, in order to have 
uh, global civilization, you need to have our star of the sun extremely stable in its luminosity. And uh, this is going to be in my next book, Design to the Core. So we looked at all kinds of stars in our, our Milky Way galaxy. We discover that to get the stability the sun exhibits, stars can only manage that for a max of 100,000 years. And so we, where are we in that 100,000 year window? We're halfway through. So in terms of your investment portfolios, I wouldn't extend it beyond 50,000 years. Because <laughs> then the sun is no longer going to be stable enough to sustain a global high technology <laughs> civilization. But it makes the point, if you want to have human beings in the universe, you want to create them four and a half billion years after uranium and thorium hit a maximum. And incidentally, of all the planetary bodies that we've been able to observe, it's now close to 5,000, our planet Earth is uranium-thorium champion of the universe. We have 630 times more thorium than what we see in the average of rocky planets, 340 times as much uranium. And in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is, I explain why we have such a huge abundance of uranium and thorium. And by the way, you won't find that much uranium and thorium in the other planets in our solar system. He says, well, that's good. I've got a third question I want to ask you. And by the way, I'm not going to give you all eight. I'm just going to give you a sampling of his eight. Okay. His third one is, okay, there's a God behind this. Why did he make it so incredibly dark? And so one reason is God wanted us to be able to see all the way back to the beginning of creation. And if the universe is not dark, you're not going to be able to see that far. And just explain to him, you know, it's a good reason why we don't have Venus and Mars change places. If we had Venus and Mars change places, he wouldn't be able to do deep sky observations because either he'd have the moon up or he'd got Venus up and that would limit uh, your observations. So, uh, but thankfully that's not the case. And again, for the people who are sitting behind me, I was just explaining how in P, the universe is incredibly dark. In fact, all the stuff that you see uh, through telescopes, that's only one quarter of a percent of all the stuff of the universe. The galaxies, stars, planets, and nebulae, that's a quarter of a percent of all the stuff of the universe. The rest of it is dark stuff. Dark energy makes up a little more than 70%. Uh, dark matter, matter that's composed of particles that don't interact well with light, that's 23.5%. And even the ordinary matter, the matter that we're made up of with protons, neutrons, electrons, that's just 4.4%, and almost all of it is dark. Stars, planets, and nebulae uh, make up just a quarter of a percent. I won't go into the details. They're covered in why the universe is the way it is, uh, both in a chapter and an appendix that follows. Uh, but one of the key reasons why the universe has to have these components of darkness, by the way, you need to fine-tune the quantity of dark energy, the quantity of exotic dark matter and ordinary matter, and not just the total, but the individual components have to be extraordinarily fine-tuned. And the degree of fine-tuning, just for the dark energy part, uh, must be fine-tuned to better than one part in 10 to the 122nd power. And uh, to put that in context, okay, if I were to give one of you an assignment, we're going to blindfold you, we're going to give you the capacity to wander throughout the whole of the universe, and there's one proton in the universe that's marked differently than all the other protons, the probability you would pick out the one specially marked one, that's one chance in 10 to the 79. So we're looking at a probability that's absurdly more remote than that. But one point of comparison is to take uh, that one chance in 10 to the 122nd power and compare it with a very best example of human inventiveness, engineering, and creativity. And in my opinion, uh, that would be the LIGO gravitational wave detector, which just a few years ago detected the first mergers of black holes to make a bigger black hole and the first mergers of neutron stars uh, to form a black hole, an amazing instrument the very best machine we human beings have ever built. But if you compare the epitome of human inventiveness and engineering design 
and compare that just with the fine-tuning of dark energy, what you discover is dark energy wins by a factor of 10 to the 96 times. Which means that the one that designed dark energy, so life would be possible in the universe, at a minimum, is a, qu uh, a trillion, 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 trillion times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than the Caltech and MIT physicists that invented and designed this machine. Now, I was at Caltech for five years. I can tell you these people are not stupid. Uh, but the one that designed uh, dark energy is that many times more intelligent and more knowledgeable than they are and at least that many times better funded than they are. Because they didn't pay for it, you all paid for it with your tax dollars. Okay, but the point I was making, because he was basically getting to the point where he was saying, okay, I can understand why your astrophysics uh, requires a deistic God, but why a theistic God? I was saying, well, a deistic God is not a personal being. He creates and then takes a 14 billion year nap. But I said, this evidence shows us we're dealing with a creative agent who is intellect, knowledge, creativity, and power. And that can only be manifested by a personal being. Only a personal being can take on those attributes. Well, I'm going to jump ahead to his eighth question. His eighth question was, okay, you're an astronomer, I'm a quantum physicist. What we both know is the universe has an extraordinary degree of entropy. In fact, it's the most entropic thing we can measure in all of science. I mean, next would be, say, a supernova eruption. But the universe itself has an entropy measure about a thousand times greater than that of a supernova. A supernova about a thousand times greater than our sun. And in terms of we human beings, you're looking at a factor uh, that's more than a trillion times different. And he said, isn't it possible for God to design things with a lot less entropy? And wouldn't that make our lives here on Earth a lot more pleasant? Because after all, anything we put our hand to starts decaying. Our bodies are decaying. Anything that we create, you might make a masterpiece, a painting, a piece of furniture, or you write a book. Whatever you do, as soon as you create it, it's in a process of decay. I said, I agree with you. That's rather depressing to think about that everything we create isn't going to last. And, uh, you know, within just a few decades, most of the stuff we create will decay away. But I said, notice, it doesn't decay so fast that you get no enjoyment from creating things. It says, after all, you're still employed, you enjoy what you're doing, uh, even though it's going to decay away and eventually it's going to be useless. Uh, the decay rate is slow enough. But he says, okay, I want to know more about this. So we talked about this. Why does God subject the universe and all of us to so much uh, decay? Uh, and incidentally, the Bible uh, speaks about this decay. It's called the law of corruption in Romans chapter 8. Some of your English translations call it the law of decay. Where you find a lot more about it is in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it basically makes the point, everything is running down. Everything is in the process of decay. We physicists call it the second law of thermodynamics. A lot of lay people refer to it as Murphy's Law, that uh, everything is in a process of decay. But I made the point that God designed the laws of physics for the eradication of evil and for willing humans to receive God's redemptive offer. I said, you know, what's unique about Christianity compared to the other major religions of the world, it's a two-creation model. Now, I do admit when you look at, say, uh, Hinduism and Islam, they speak about heaven. But their heaven is described in terms that fit with everything that we've experienced in this universe. It's not just a distinct creation like you see in Christianity. So I was explaining to the quantum physicists that what we see in the Bible is a two-creation model where God creates the universe as a tool to permanently eradicate evil while he enhances the capacity of willing human beings to receive more love and to express more love. That was God's purpose in creating in the first place. He wanted to uh, magnify the expression of his love. And then the new creation is a realm where since there's no evil, 
uh, God can actually release redeemed human beings to experience relationships, not just linearly, but geometrically, and therefore greatly enhance our capacity to experience uh, love and uh, to express that love. He said, well, why didn't God give us that right now? I said, if we were in geometric time, then evil would run completely out of control. First, he must eradicate evil before he moves us into the new creation. And you see this in Romans chapter 8. The whole creation has been groaning under its bondage to decay. And as I mentioned in Ecclesiastes 1 and 10 to 12, everything we see decays, and the decay never stops. Try to stop the decay, you can't. I know lots of women go to these drugstores to buy products to try to stop the decay, uh, but a few experiments tells you there's limitations in what it can do. Okay, uh, but the decay is also optimal to allow stars to form. I said, if you didn't have a very high rate of decay in the universe, stars would never form. And if stars never form, there'd be no possibility for life. And the planets wouldn't form either. Moreover, if you look more closely to home, we need a very high level of entropy for all of you to go to that snack table there, grab some food, digest that food, and be able to use that food to perform work. And then, you know, that's the whole basis of animal life, is being able to consume food and transfer the energy in that food in a useful way to perform work. But if you had a lower rate of entropy, the conversion process would generate so much heat in your body, it would kill you. And so we need a very high level of entropy just for animal life to exist in the universe. And he said, okay, tell me, how does this restrain evil? And I said, well, said, notice the decay rate is not so high to discourage us from productive work, but neither is it so low as to let human sin and evil go unrestrained. And you see this right in the beginning of the Bible. The moment that Adam and Eve choose to experience evil rather than be taught by evil, uh, God says to them, okay, to the degree you commit evil, to the degree you, uh, uh, you know, commit sin, you're going to experience more pain, more work, and more wasted time. Now you see this explicitly in Genesis 3 where God says to Adam, because of your decision, you're now going to experience more work. He says to Eve, because of your decision, you're going to experience more pain in childbirth. And a lot of people think God is being specific to the different sexes. Well, all of you ladies can testify. Men are not the only ones that experience more work. And the men in the audience can also testify the women are not alone in experiencing pain in childbirth. It's something that my wife shared with me. Because if you've met, ever met my wife, she's five, four and a half, and really slim. Uh, but I come from a family of uh, people who say giants. I'm the shortest man in my family. All the rest of the men are way over six feet. I've got several relatives that are six, seven and a half. And so uh, we had two sons that were 23 and a half inches long and were weighing over nine pounds. So uh, my wife, I had to be with my wife when she was giving birth. She went through incredible pain and agony. But years later, she shared with me, that's not the greatest pain in childbirth. And you know, every parent can uh, recognize this. The greatest pain in childbirth is watching your children grow up. You teach them the way that they should go, and they don't go that way, at least not consistently. And when they depart from the ways of the Lord, that's the real pain in childbirth. And, uh, you know, it's always a miracle when your children get through the teenage years. Uh, and then uh, there, there's, there's redemption that follows that. But the whole point here is that there's more pain and more work. And it's Ecclesiastes that talks about the fact that there's more wasted time. The more evil and sin we commit, the more work we have to do, the more time we have to spend, and the more pain we experience to undo the damage that comes from our sin and evil. And this is why the Bible tells us, hey, uh, those of you in authority, make sure the perpetrators of the evil are the ones that get the more pain, more work, and wasted time. And I've seen that with my sons. They were very clever at transferring the consequences to their mother and I. 
And so it's our job to discipline them in such a way of saying, no, no, you're the ones that are going to have to undo the damage. So they go through that uh, process. Well, that was question number eight. Then he turned to me and said, I've got one more question. Why did you have such well-prepared answers to my eight questions? And I said, well, you're not the first scientist that's asked me these questions. Matter of fact, I've written a book on this. And that your questions are all the chapter titles in, the, in my book. And I said, I don't believe you. But I had a copy of the book in my briefcase. So I pulled the book out, and it was this book right here, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. He opened up the table of contents and says, those are my eight questions. Moreover, they're my eight questions in the order I asked them, as chapters one through eight. He was astounded. And he, and he wanted a copy of the book. It was pretty clear, so I gave him the copy of the book. Then he turned to me and said, you know, I'm fluent in English, but do you have anything in German? And I said, I've only got one last item in my briefcase, but it was this item, Journey Toward Creation. It's a documentary that we did many years ago where I take you on a simulated journey from the surface of the earth to the edge of the universe, where you're going back in time and getting closer and closer to the one that created the universe. And it's in 11 languages, one of which was German. So he took that with him as well. And then we're walking towards baggage claim together. And he said, I just calculated the probability that a German quantum physicist would be sitting in a first class seat next to a Canadian astrophysicist also sitting in a first class seat. He says, it's about one chance in two billion. I says, well, consider this. You came here as an atheist. I was a Christian. What, are the, what do we throw that in there? He said, yeah, it's more remote than one chance in two billion. So, but it documents this. The heavens proclaim the righteousness of God and all the people see his glory. Amen. Now, what saddens me is that now for the first time in human history, the vast majority of the human population really don't see much of the glory of God in the heavens. I've been to places like Beijing and Shanghai and Hong Kong, and uh, on a clear night you can look up at the sky and not see a single star in the sky. The level of light and air pollution is so intense, you can't see anything. In fact, one of our employees uh, was uh, housing an exchange student uh, for a few weeks. She was from China. And uh, they were outside, and he said, what's that thing up in the sky? And he said, that's the moon. Now, she had seen the moon before, but only when it's directly overhead. She had never seen the moon at a lower. And so, yeah, I mean, for a lot of people, the heavens aren't declaring a thing uh, because uh, we don't have the sky that Abraham had years ago. Okay, I want to finish up before we go into Q&A with one more short story. Because uh, what I'm explaining here is the following principle. If you're prepared with good reasons for your faith and hope in Jesus Christ and are able to share those reasons with gentleness and respect, you will see God supernaturally bringing people to you that in advance he is prepared to hear and respond. God knew that he was a quantum physicist from Germany. He knew that I was an astrophysicist from Canada and the U.S. He arranged to put us two together. Because of what I didn't share with you, as he told me, this is the first time he'd flown first class. He was flying to Seattle uh, to consult uh, with uh, Microsoft, and they insisted on flying in first class. And I, was, I had a cheap ticket, but I got transferred into first class. So this is like the book of Acts, where God engineers things to bring people together so that the gospel uh, can uh, be spread. Now, in my book, Always Be Ready, I talk about all the experiences I've had on airplanes. But here's one thing I think really drives home the principle that I'm sharing from 1 Peter 3.15. Over half of the conversations I have with people on airplanes are with people with doctoral degrees in science or doctoral degrees in theology. And where there's a doctoral degree in theology, it's a theologian that doesn't believe the Bible is the Word of God. Okay? And there's a lot of them out there, by the way. 
We all know that does not make up 50% of the U.S. flying public. It makes up, at best, a tiny percentage of 1% of the flying public. But God knows who they are, He knows who I am, and somehow He works it to put it together. And somehow He also works it so uh, they're not just watching a movie. Uh, and by the way, I always take my computer with me, and sometimes the easiest way the conversation gets started I just start doing some work on it, and people will go and say, that looks really interesting, and a conversation gets started. Now, again, you don't have to have a degree in astrophysics for this to happen to you. I have a friend uh, who was part of the Mormon faith, but he began to read the Bible, realized what Mormonism taught uh, was not true, came out of Mormonism. He flies more frequently than I do, but what he shares with me is this. You can't imagine how many times I'm seated right next to a Mormon or an ex-Mormon and we get to have a conversation. Whatever your background is, whatever your experience is, whatever reasons that you develop, God will use that as a way to give you opportunities to share your faith and be part of bringing people to faith in Christ. I say that because most of my experiences, it's planting a seed. I mean, I've had many opportunities to lead people to faith in Christ, even on airplanes, uh, even a group, uh, but most of the time it's planting seeds. God uses all of us to bring people on a journey from unbelief to belief. You're part of that journey, and you'll be content to have a significant role in making that happen. Again, before we go to Q&A, one more story. And this is an example where it's not a personal exchange. This is an exchange I had with people on different continents. It was all in writing. And what happened was I was asked, okay, there's this peer-reviewed journal uh, that wants scientists uh, to write articles on the connection between science and religion. And I checked out the journal, and it was you know, basically a journal promoting a non-theistic worldview. And so the anticipation was that the people submitting papers uh, would not be believers, but they would see some kind of connection between science and religion in general. And a few of us were Christians that were submitting papers. I think I was the only one that got my paper accepted. And uh, it's online. You can read the entire paper free of charge. There's no paywall. What was really interesting about this journal is that they published all the critiques uh, from the reviewers of the paper. And all three of them were atheists. But they also published my responses. So you get to see the back and forth in writing between me and uh, the three reviewers and how they started off saying, this paper's got to be rejected. This guy actually believes this stuff. <laughs> to a point where they said, grudgingly, we have to let it get published. Mainly because I just kept responding. And again, you can see how it's not just in our verbal response, it's in our written response where we need to be able to polish the ability to communicate and respond uh, to these challenges with gentleness and respect. If you want to read it, uh, all you need to do is Google, uh, uh, just try to remember it, yeah, black holes as evidence for God's care. Uh, so if you do that, black holes as evidence for God's care will pop right up you'll be able to see the written exchange uh, between me uh, and the others. And uh, what's fascinating too, is we're getting about a thousand people uh, reading the entire article uh, per month. What journal is it in? Uh, it's in a journal called Religions. So uh, they had a special issue on science and religion. And uh, I think only two of us are actually Christians who got published uh, in that, that special issue. Okay, with that, I'm going to throw it open to questions. So your emphasis on evangelism, uh, you make it look so easy. Uh, you tell these stories, and I'm sure that people sitting in the audience are thinking, well, sure, you can do that. But they have their own challenges. I really enjoyed our ride yesterday and our talk and our visit and I thought it would be very helpful for them from an evangelistic point of view for you to talk about your challenge that you're on the autistic spectrum and you have talked about what a challenge that has been in starting the ministry and in relating to people and witnessing to people and I thought it'd be good for them to hear 
your perspective on that, because if you can overcome that, okay, then certainly they can use their strengths and overcome their own weaknesses as well. Sure. Well, I can tell you this. Everyone that's on the spectrum is different from everybody else on the spectrum. So my story is going to be different from saying uh, Temple Grandin's story or anyone else's on the spectrum. Uh, but for me, um, I was actually reading before I was talking. Uh, so talking to people was a real challenge. Uh, but I also realized if I don't start talking, I'm not going to do well in school. So I forced myself to begin to talk. Um, and uh, I started giving uh, lectures like this, public lectures, because often with people on the spectrum, it's much easier to talk to 300 people than it is to talk to three. Uh, so I actually started giving uh, lectures uh, when I was 16 years of age. But I remember coming to California, and uh, I met my wife, and she said, uh, you know, we were friends for three years before we dated, but the thing that she observes, she says, every time you lecture, you just stare at the floor for the entire lecture, and even during the Q&A time, you just stare at the floor. It says, have you ever thought about actually looking at people uh, when you give a talk? I said, well, that's a novel idea. So uh, I gave a talk, it was a two-hour talk with the Q&A, and she came up to me afterwards and says, were you aware you looked at one guy the entire two hours? <laughs> Do you know how uncomfortable it made that guy feel? And says, you need to look at different people, you know. So I said, okay, next time I did that. And she says, your eyes were darting all over the audience. <laughs> you need to settle on one person for a few seconds. And so finally I did it exactly the way she said, and I totally lost where I was in my talk. <laughs> so I, I can't do both at once. So now, decades later, I'm now able to do uh, both at once. But it took a lot of training, a lot of practice. And that's one reason why I load my computer with visuals. And I got a clock built in there. Why? It's not for your benefit, it's for my benefit. Because if I'm kind of engaging you with my eyes, I lose where I am in my talk. But I go back to my computer and say, oh yeah, that's where I was. And I can kind of pick up. And, you know, to me, the talk always feels highly disjointed. But what I've discovered is most audiences don't even notice uh, where it's disjointed. And I lost my place several times in my message in front of you, uh, at least five or six times. But probably only a few of you really noticed uh, that I was slipping up. So, but what I share with people that are on the spectrum, spend as much time as possible with neurotypical people and ask them for help. And it'll take decades, but you'll get there. And uh, don't do what I did, which was join the astronomy department at Caltech. Because what happened was, I was surrounded by people just like me. And we all thought we were normal. It's the rest of the world that sort of killed her. And so we never developed. And uh, you know, I was wondering why these people at Caltech had such horrible personal relationships. It's because they were not spending adequate time with neurotypical pe people. And for all of you who are neurotypical, there's a challenge. God made us all different. You know, spend time with people who are dyslexic. Uh, spend time with people who are ADHD. Spend time with people like me. Because uh, they can help you. And you can help them. And so, you know, there's actually a paper that's been published. What maximally benefits human civilization in terms of autistic people? But Maxley benefits if the ratio is about 150 to 1. And interestingly, that's about exactly where the ratio lies. And so God set it up in such a way that one out of 150 of us would be on the spectrum. Uh, I mean, Mozart was on the spectrum. Where would we be without his music? And if you look at the life of Mozart, his relationships, his human relationships were horrible. But look at the music he uh, was able to develop. So, we all need one another. God made all of us different. And, uh, and by the way, I'll take questions on any subject. So, First off, thank you very much for your talk. It was an excellent talk. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that there's some scientific apologetics that you avoid. And I'm curious, what are those areas of science and why do you avoid them? Well, I've noticed there's a lot of science apologetics 
uh, where Christians talk to one another, debate one another, but they never apply it to bring people to faith in Christ, never test it out on non-Christians and see how it flies. For example, a lot of Christian science apologists are very focused on, okay, what does it take to get functional proteins? Uh, and because they're not engaging their apology, I mean, it's a good apologetic argument, a possibility of taking random amino acids and assembling them to make a functional protein is really remote. But because they're dialoguing with one another in isolation, they don't realize it doesn't work in trying to bring non-Christian chemists to faith in Christ. Uh, another example would be the uh, uh, very popular example in the Christian community is uh, the, the, uh, the motor of the uh, little uh, hairy uh, microbe and basically saying there's an irreducible complexity argument. It is a valid argument, uh, but the way Christians frame it is they grossly overstate their case, just like they do with the protein thing. If you actually boil it down to the real numbers, you get a powerful argument. But again, that won't happen unless you're actually engaging the non-Christian experts in the field. And you can read the books put out by my colleague, Fazal Rana. He's our staff biochemist. He says, irreducible complexity is an effective argument, but there are another 10 biochemical arguments for God that are way more powerful. And when you lead off with irreducible complexity, the non-Christian biochemist says, why are you leading off with your weakest argument? They get suspicious, and you lose the opportunity to bring them to faith in Christ. Is it on? Oh, okay, it's on. Um, granted, doesn't it have to be like made in a millisecond or like five seconds or it's not granite? Is that true? Well, it depends on the kind of granite. Granite, different granites take different time, but yes, it's typically a rapid formation event. So. Could the evolution or that time period happen like that? Well, you get granite formation throughout the geological history of the Earth, so it doesn't all happen at the same time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you ever go down the Grand Canyon, you'll see layers that were formed extremely rapidly, interface with layers that were formed over hundreds of millions of years. Metamorphic rock, uh, that's a very gradual process. So part of being prepared to share your faith is also being able to anticipate arguments from the other side. So who do you, um, who is the most formidable opponents in your opinion? And so we can begin to prepare ourselves and really understanding their arguments as well. Well, I mean, again, just share your faith with people who are not believers, you'll find out uh, what they consider to be the strongest arguments. I mean, in my own experience, typically what I get from people that are physicists or astronomers, they will appeal to things like quantum gravity and say, hey, maybe there's a loophole here where I'm not stuck with this God beyond space and time. But they're appealing to a realm of uh, science where our measurements are not able to produce any information. Therefore, they think they're free to speculate, which means we have to develop a response. That's why I put a whole chapter in the Crater in the Cosmos, the fourth edition, non responding to non-empirical arguments for atheism. But in one sense, that's a huge victory for the Christian faith, namely that these highly educated atheists now are forced to appeal to what can't be known rather than what can be known. And so what I tried to demonstrate in the fourth edition of the Crater and the Cosmos is that we're now, the, the, the thinking was we'll never penetrate the quantum gravity era. By the way, era is really a wrong word. We're talking about the first 10 to the minus 43 seconds after the beginning of the universe. So it's an extremely tiny instant of time, but it is a, a condition of the universe where we have no instrument that can duplicate those energy densities. But I write in the Crater in the Cosmos, we've actually found some ways to begin to penetrate the quantum gravity era. And what that has done is it's pushed back the atheist speculations into a smaller corner. So what I basically encourage people to do in that chapter is say, demonstrate to these people who are making those appeals that they're backed into a progressively smaller and smaller corner as we learn more and more. 
And to a scientist, that's always evidence you got the wrong model uh, if you're being backed in uh, to a corner like that. Uh, however, I did run into one atheist physicist that said, I don't care. As long as I've got some place I can speculate, that's where I'm going to hang my faith. And it's like, okay, I cannot give you absolute proof that God exists, but neither can you give me absolute proof that your wife exists, and yet you maintain a relationship with her. Do you think you're being philosophically inconsistent? I'm appreciating your uh, talk even more because I started reading uh, Improbable Planet, which I got off the table over there uh, in a previous visit. But um, I'm really excited that you can talk to people. Uh, my dad was a physicist, but it didn't stick. So I can appreciate what you're saying. But on the other hand, and, and I'm and I'm trying to speak with respect and gentleness, like to my best best man from my wedding who thinks everything I put on Facebook that I'm an idiot now, you know, because I'm Christian. But so on the one hand, if you're lucky enough to go to the 360 bridge in Austin, or you get to go to Enchanted Rock, which is a granite dome that's a beautiful place to go, fly a kite off it in the summer no matter how hot it is. Um, I'll look at that and I'll see little rivulets just starting to form from the little bitty pools of water up there, and that thing's supposed to have been there for millions of years, and I'm, I'm kind of stupid, but a million years is awfully long when you're talking about, like you said, entropy. And you go to the 360 bridge, I found the, the geology department of UT looking at the cliffs there. And I said, how, how much time is there between the bottom layer of this cliff and the top? And they said 200 million years. And I'm going, I'm kind of stupid, but 200 million years is an awful long period of time. I didn't see water damage being different. The color of the rock in this layer and a couple million layer years below was that. So I said to them, that sounds like a political statement, not science. And then I left, you know. So that didn't make any friends, I'm sure. No, probably not. But, but I'm just wondering, how, how do you feel about the Grand Canyon, all the things that the other guys bring up? I, I appreciate that God would love us so much that he would fine tune everything. But what do you think about the other guys that are pointing out that, some, that they get so much joy out of every sign at every part telling you how many millions of years, they get more joy out of telling you how many millions of years it was than what you're looking at, the elements that are in it, what, you know. So they get so much joy out of that. Do you see a little problem with the whole layers and fossil record and it was developed so quick and, it, and they get so much joy in pushing it. Why do they get so much joy? Okay, I think yeah, there, there's a major debate going on with the Grand Canyon. You've got some Christians claiming all those layers you see in the Grand Canyon were laid down very rapidly. And they're right, a lot of them were laid down rapidly. Uh, but they overlook all the ones that were very gradual, like the metamorphic layers. Um, and they try to claim it was a single event that was responsible for all of them. The truth is, it's many times separated catastrophic events that are responsible for the layers you see there. And so there's this misperception in the Christian community that the debate over geology is one of catastrophism versus uniformitarianism. Mainstream geology believes in both. They believe there's uniformitarian uh, uh, you know, operations taking place, uh, but interspersed, there are many, a great many, uh, cat catastrophic events that are extremely rapidly. So it's not either or, it's both and. Both and are taking place. And uh, I've had friends who've gone down the Grand Canyon where the people think it all happened all at once and said, well, what about that layer? What about that layer? And the response is, oh, we're not going to talk about that layer. We're going to talk about this layer. Well, that's not how science works. You have to look at all the data. So as a, and we have a question coming up here, but as a natural follow-up to that question, as Christian believers, mm -hmm. why should we not be afraid that that contradicts the Bible? Why should we not be afraid that it contradicts the Bible? There are some people that believe that that uniformitarianism contradicts the Bible. As Christians, why should we not be afraid? Well, of that? Uh, right now, uh, I finished the book, uh, Design to the Core. It'll be out in June or July of this year. Uh, but I know under the gun, I've got to do another book that's due in uh, May. Uh, and it's on dual revelation. And it's because what we're seeing happening in the theological community 
as they're saying, because of the advances in science, particularly in evolutionary biology, we have to abandon this archaic idea that God reveals himself through two books and the two books corroborate one another. And we have to abandon this archaic idea of biblical inerrancy. So, and they're really targeting reasons to believe. And so our staff came to me and says, Hugh, you're the president, you've got to write a response. Appreciate your prayers. I'm really working around the clock trying to get that book done in time because we've invited a number of theologians to come to our office in June and they're going to be critiquing the book. I've got to get the book done by the time uh, they're showing up. Uh, but the whole point is, often the doctrine of dual revelation is misunderstood. The biblical doctrine of dual revelation is that God has revealed himself faithfully in a trustworthy manner through two books, the book of nature and the book of scripture. And you see it explicitly taught in Psalm 19 and Romans 1, that God has revealed himself through these two books. However, there's no guarantee that our human interpretation of either book will be accurate. After all, we have incomplete knowledge and we're sinners, we have biases. And therefore there's every possibility that our human interpretation of the book of nature will be in conflict with our human interpretation of the book of scripture. And in science, we refer to those as anomalies. Whereas we do research, we realize things aren't fitting. But notice what happens in the scientific community. When they see something in zoology that's not fitting what we understand in physics, rather than saying there's something wrong with the physics or the zoology, they say there's something wrong with our interpretation. Or we don't know enough, and they do enough research. And what happens? The anomaly gets resolved. And that's been the consistent pattern for science for over the last 500 years. Every anomaly that comes up gets resolved. However, there's a caveat with that. Every time we resolve an anomaly in science, it exposes several more anomalies we didn't even know were there. Uh, however, if the new anomalies are less significant and less problematic, that's a sign we're on the pathway to truth, that we're on the pathway towards a correct interpretation. If the anomalies get more problematic and bigger and more numerous, then we say, we got the wrong model. Uh, we need to either seriously revise our model or abandon it and come up with a new model. Now, theology operates the same way. We got 66 books of the Bible. So as a theologian is studying the book of Romans and comparing it with his friend who's studying the book of Hebrews and it doesn't fit, that's called a theological anomaly. But they operate in the same principle that science does. Okay. It's not that there's something wrong with Hebrews or something wrong with Romans. There's something wrong with the way we've interpreted the text. And maybe we need to talk to one another and do more theological research and figure what's going on, get the anomaly resolved, and expect when the anomaly does get resolved, it's going to expose more anomalies. The problem is that people outside the research paradigm think that there's an anomaly that kills the whole thing. And what really alarms me, I'm now running into doctoral level theologians who are saying, we have an anomaly here between the book of nature and the book of scripture, and this kills the book of scripture as a reliable revelation from God. So they're not a scientist, so I'm jumping as a scientist and saying, you're believing that the Darwinian evolutionary model uh, is correct, uh, but you really haven't studied uh, evolutionary biology or you've only looked at it from one discipline. And so what I'm gonna be doing in the book is putting a chapter saying, relevant to evolutionary biology is stellar astrophysics. And so bringing in the physics of the sun and showing how this gives us a new insight on evolutionary biology, which basically demonstrates this is not a naturalistic mechanism. Uh, or if you take the genetics, the genetics and the paleontology have an enormous disconnect. Uh, through the genetics, you're getting a prediction of uh, a fossil event that is discordant with the fossil evidence by a quarter of a billion years. That should tell you that you're either misinterpreting the paleontology or the genetics, and frankly, I think we're misinterpreting the genetics, because the paleontology evidence is fairly secure, and so digging into that. But the bottom line is we don't have to abandon the doctrine that Adam and Eve 
are a special creation by God and are all descended from Adam and Eve. So, and there's a lot of books put up by theologians that are saying, we have to abandon this archaic idea that we came from Adam and Eve. And worse than that, they're now saying Paul got it wrong. He's wrong on original sin. Basically saying, we are sinners, but we didn't get it from Adam. Well, my problem with that is, that's in a lot of creeds of the church. And it's really difficult to read Romans any other way than the idea that the doctrine of original sin really is correct. And maybe we need to be questioning the genetics, uh, not coming to the conclusion that Paul didn't know what he was talking about. I even read one book where they said, this idea that Paul was well-educated, forget it. What he wrote, he couldn't have. So it's like, wait a minute. This guy, the Apostle Paul, is no dummy. So, uh, Dr. Voss, uh, would you, do you have any comments on this new telescope that we put out into space recently? Well, the James Webb Telescope, just this morning, produced its first image of a star. Now, that tells us the telescope's working, so that's good news. <coughs> uh, but NASA also wants to take at least three more months before they do any serious astronomy. Uh, it's kind of like what happens when the Navy launches a new aircraft carrier. They go through several months of testing to make sure everything works. So that's what's happening with the James Webb Telescope. But yeah, everything is good news. It's in exactly the location they wanted it to be. The thing opened up. It's fully functional. So yeah, I anticipate. And the idea was they were going to do a six-month shakedown. But they're not talking. We may be able to abbreviate it to as short as three months and uh, get the thing actually producing some real uh, science. And uh, the main reason it was designed in the first place is that it's a telescope, the only telescope, that's got the power to image the very first-born stars in the universe and determine what those stars were like. And uh, that's a major missing piece of the whole puzzle of the uh, Big Bang creation model. And so getting that piece uh, nailed down will be huge. Uh, but the telescope's going to be used for a lot of other things as well. Everybody's clamoring for time on that James Webb Space Telescope. And by the way, they're already planning the next one. I, my question was also on the James Webb. Uh, but a related question is, um, if you think of the, the LIGO uh, mm -hmm. experiment as a, a low-resolution gravity telescope, are, are there, is there discussions in your field about how to, how to turn that into something that can do more high fidelity imaging and things from a gravitational perspective? And then the broader question is like, as an astro, astrophysicist or astro, what's your cause, what's your? Uh, you can call me an astronomer, astro, an astrophysicist, astrophysicist, a physicist, all those work. What, what are the um, areas in your field that uh, are yet to be, or, or maybe uh, f um, possibly achievable? But they're they're on the edge of being achievable, like the LIGO. Like what's gonna what's coming next in your field? Well, the thing about LIGO was that uh, people were doubting whether it would have the power to actually detect the gravitational waves from a black hole merger event. The fact that it's been phenomenally successful in doing that, and repeatedly successful, and even be able to see the gravitational waves from two neutron stars merging together and being able to alert the whole astronomical community. Because the wonderful thing about neutron stars merging together to become a black hole, you don't just get gravitational waves, you get the entire range of electromagnetic waves. So we learned a whole bunch from that. But the bottom line is this, the fact that it's been proven, everybody is jumping on the gravity wave instrument game. And so uh, we have a third arm in Italy. Uh, India now is uh, almost finished. Uh, their gravity wave telescope. There's about a dozen gravity wave instruments that are being developed, and the more you have scattered over planet Earth, the more detailed information you'll get. So I think within three years, you're going to see about a factor of 10 improvement in the resolution of uh, these gravity wave observations. So, uh, yeah, and the exciting thing is, it's going to tell us exactly where all the heavy elements come from, and the rate at which they're being produced and where they're being produced in the universe. So, I'm, and by the way, I'm committed to keep you up to date on that. I've already written three articles on uh, gravity waves, and uh, I'll keep you up to date. Dr. Ross, thank you for your excellent talk this morning. Uh, uh, wait a minute.
if uh, if God is omnipotent, why couldn't He make the galaxy and uh, without entropy immediately, uh, as we see it now? Why did He go through all this long process? It seems to imply what, uh, either God has limits or He's playing games. And my other question is: Do you believe that there's intelligent life on other planets? And if you could reference the Wow signal that the big ear antenna received on the day Elvis Presley died. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did write an article on the latter. If you go to reasons.org and kind of put in the search engine wow signal, the article will pop right up. So uh, you can read my... And by the way, I've been friends with a lot of people that are part of the SETI program, and I can share some insights on that. Uh, the first part of your question was again? Why couldn't God have... Oh yeah, why couldn't God have sped things up with our galaxy? Yeah. It seems like he has limits or or he's playing games. I mean, why did he do it the way he's done it? Yeah, I if, guess, he's, if he's omnipotent. Yeah, no, I get that frequently from scientists uh, who are not theists. It's like, you know, why couldn't have God done it differently? Which is why what I put in why the universe is the way it is. Here are the known purposes for God designing the universe and our galaxy the way he did. And what I often get from people who are not theists, they're only looking at one purpose uh, for God making our galaxy the way he did. And I said, no, there's way more than just one purpose. And why the universe is the way it is, I list 13 different purposes that we know of. There may be more. Now, when you've got different purposes, then you run into the design trade-off challenge. To give you an example, you can go to your auto dealer here and say, I want an automobile that's got the best gas mileage uh, that's conceivable, but I also want it to have the performance of a Ferrari sports car. And uh, the auto dealer will look at you and say, that's not possible. I can give you one that's kind of a little bit of each, or I can give you one that's got really good gas mileage, but it's not going to perform like this Ferrari, uh, or I can give you one that's got high performance, but you're going to pay a lot for gas. And so those are called design trade-offs. And so, given that uh, God wanted physical life in our galaxy, but also wanted the universe designed in such a way that it could be an effective tool in his hand to eradicate evil and suffering quickly and efficiently, this means you're going to run into these design trade-off uh, issues. And uh, he also wanted the universe to be a teaching tool for the angels. So that's another factor you've got to build in. So when you take into account all these different purposes, and again, these are only the purposes we know of. God may have other reasons for doing it the way he did. You realize, okay, this explains why the universe has to be exactly the way it is. Uh, it can't be any different. Now, it could be different if God had a different goal. Just like, uh, you know, an engineer uh, building an aircraft. It depends on the goal that that engineer has. So just like uh, you know, you could say that God is constrained, but he's constrained in the same way that an engineer building an instrument is constrained. It all depends upon the purposes uh, that your design is going to achieve. And particularly where you've got multiple independent purposes, this really narrows down the options that you're going to have. If you want to see a debate on this, I debated uh, Victor Stenger, a particle physicist, at uh, the International Skeptic Society conference that was held a few years ago. And he brought that very issue up. And I said, uh, well, uh, he said, this is all for life as we know it. Couldn't you have radically different design features for life that's different than us? I said, well, you must be talking about the angels. Because yeah, God has designed a very different realm for the angels than he's designed for us. It's governed by different laws of physics than we see here. God's going to create the new creation, and guess what? The new creation is going to have radically different dimensions and laws of physics. Why? Because it's going to be a realm where evil simply cannot be expressed uh, by any free will being ever again, which opens up a whole lot more options uh, for why. And that's why that creation is going to be so much better than our creation. Okay, now I think I'm, I'm ready. Again, thank you for your talk. Um, there used to be a radio personality named Paul Harvey that would tell us the rest of the story. Um, have you had any subsequent contact with your passenger in first class? The answer is no. And by the way, 
I write that uh, in the book, Always Be Ready, that almost always when you have these encounters, expect the answer to be no. Unless you've been doing it a long time. When you've been doing it a long time, you start to get some yeses back. But the few yeses you get is just the tiny tip of the iceberg. Uh, so what's most common for me is I'll run into people, usually at events like this, somebody will come up and say, you know, I watched a DVD that you produced uh, 16 years ago, and I'm here to tell you that watching that DVD brought me to faith in Christ. But it took him 16 years to tell me that. So, uh, and be encouraged that your ministry and the seeds that you plant are bearing fruit. But don't expect to see all the fruit. You'll see a little bit of the fruit, but don't expect to see all of it. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to rejoice in when we meet one another uh, after we go from this slide to the next slide. We're going to hear all these stories. So, for example, I put in my book, uh, Always Be Ready, I was not raised in a Christian home, but a significant step on my journey to faith in Christ was hearing for 15 seconds a street preacher in downtown Vancouver. Now, my parents were quickly yanking me away from this Bible nut, but I heard 15 seconds, and I didn't forget the 15 seconds I heard. And so I'm looking forward to a day when I can say, remember when you were on that street corner in Vancouver and you thought nobody was listening? This little boy that was there being whisked away by his parents was listening. So we just never know. And therefore, I always make the point to when you are sharing your faith, be aware not just of the person you're talking to, but somebody that might be listening in. And sometimes God encourages someone. I mean, I've seen this on aircraft all the time or people in the road behind me or in front of me uh, will be uh, listening. I mean, you can tell because they're turning off all their audio devices, <laughs> kind of turning around like this. And so realizing, okay, maybe the person I'm talking to, nothing's happening, but something might be happening there. And don't expect them to tell you. Now, one of these days, I hope to run into that German quantum physicist, but if I never do, it's not going to bother me. Uh, first of all, thank you for taking time to be here with us when you're under the gun to produce a book. <laughs> so thank you. Um, and one comment, I got a Gideon Bible from a street preacher, and that's what reading that is what led to my conversion. Um, my, you open the door to off-topic questions, and so if you don't want to answer this, uh, it's totally okay with me, but I got to ask, because this is, this is on current event currently on my mind and heart. Uh, do you have any thoughts, observations, or comments about the Canadian trucker blockade? <laughs> <laughs> do I have any comments about the Canadian trucker blockade? Well, I can say this. They picked a good year to do it. Because typically Ottawa this time of year is 30 below. And this year they had an exceptionally warm winter, so it's a little more comfortable to have a protest uh, this year than previous years. But truthfully, I've not been following uh, this news event. I've been too focused on working on the book. So uh, ask someone else here who's more familiar with what's going on than me. Hey, um, I, uh, I'm moving here from California and uh, I was a part of a homeless ministry and evangelism ministries out there. And just wondering if there's any outreaches out here that anybody goes to that I could maybe hop into to evangelize to whoever uh, just some group gatherings that do that. Okay, maybe there is. I mean, you would know. Okay. Yeah, come up and ask one of the officers. So, David, raise your hand. Ed, LD, raise your hand. Solid 19, they should be. Mary. <laughs> so, Mary is uh, actually the director of the LFC here. And Mary, I'm sorry. Mary, right. Yes, Mary. <laughs> so, Mary, you raise your hand again. So, one of us, if you'll come up and, and ask us. All right, thank you. And and also, next question. And, and it has a song on key, a Next question. You have some right Okay, there we go on the back Hello there. Thanks for coming to Austin. Um, I have a problem that has, it's maybe something that other people run into. I've been watching a lot of your videos recently, and invariably I have to stop it and ask my husband, who's an uh, engineer, what? Did uh, Hugh say, or what is that term? And he gives me a little mini science explanation or lesson, just enough to follow what you're saying and on we go until I stop it again. 
And I want to share a lot of your materials with people I know, but we do, we've never taken physics or astronomy. So is there anything that RTV could produce? Just a short little, where you take all these terms that you tend to use and make a little, a little mini course or booklet so that we can read that first and then watch your videos and not have to stop them and ask somebody, what is he talking about? Okay, I think you're suggesting that we need to produce more glossaries <laughs> when we, uh, yeah, we do a few, but yeah, I've been told by our editorial team we need to do more glossaries. So uh, I'll take your counsel under advisement. You might uh, recommend a bigger picture on creation, which would more delay people. Yeah, we do have materials that are specifically targeted for lay people and children. So. A, a bigger picture on creation is one that I think was written by Christopher K. Bonfrey. Right, right. It would probably be good for that. Yes. yes, sir. Um, various theologians in the past have postulated that God deliberately hides himself behind his creation. And uh, part of that argument is that he does that so that you would have to have faith to see him behind his creation. And then he gives you that faith. What would you say to that statement? Yeah, uh, I would say not as hidden as many people think. I mean, you see this in Romans chapter 1, that uh, the creation is clearly revealed uh, God, not just the existence of God, but the attributes of God. And therefore, we're all without excuse. And it's not saying, hey, uh, only those with PhDs are without excuse. No, it's saying everybody is without excuse. Children are without excuse. That is how clearly God has revealed himself in nature. I think one of the best demonstrations of that is what you see in the book of Job. Start in chapter 7, go to chapter 19, and Job repeatedly cites what he sees in nature as evidence uh, for the existence of God, the attributes of God, and even the plan of salvation. So the fact that he was able to discern the plan of salvation, the assurance of the salvation that you see in chapter 19, long before any scripture even existed. So. Now, God is hidden in the sense we don't see him directly as we see one another. And uh, I remember there was an atheist in my Sunday class saying, hey, if God exists, why doesn't he just show up in your class so we can all see him? And my comment was, well, if he were to do that, he wouldn't be God. In other words, if we could access God all the time uh, in the flesh, uh, then he really wouldn't be the God of the Bible. It's important that he transcend his creation. I mean, that's what the Bible tells us about God. So in that context, as it says in Timothy, uh, God, no one can see God, no one can touch God. He transcends his universe, but he's revealed himself through what he has uh, created. And uh, therefore, it's actually good for us that we can't see him all the time. And hey, have you ever watched that debate I had with um, Peter Atkins, uh, the British chemist? And if you just put in Hugh Ross, Peter Atkins, it'll pop right up. Uh, towards the end of that debate, he was challenged, what kind of evidence would you need uh, to believe like Hugh believes? He said, well, I suppose uh, if Jesus were to appear to me, right in front of me, just two feet away, uh, that would, and he said, no, that wouldn't persuade me. And what I would realize is I was delusional and I was having a false vision. And uh, therefore he's basically saying, no matter how God reveals himself to me, I'm not going to believe. And that's what Jesus said. Hey, even if some were to rise from the dead, they won't believe. And so God has clearly revealed himself. But not everybody wants a relationship with God. And when I run into atheists, I tell them that, look, God's not going to send you to hell. You get to choose where you want to spend eternity. If you want to spend eternity in fellowship with God, he's got a place for you. If you want nothing whatsoever to do with God, He's got a place for you. You get to choose. Well, I'll be next. Uh, real quick, directly addressing that question, our June presentation is going to be by uh, Dr. Sarah Salviander, the astrophysicist and former atheist, and she's going to be talking about how God has left selfies of himself all over creation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> John, yes. right here. Yes. Sarah, you're on the Yes, Sarah's here. She'll be here. All right. <laughs> You mentioned the word dimension, 
In your book, Beyond the Cosmos, you discuss many dimensions. Time is a human construct of our dimension. Are there dimensions where time is not a factor? Ecclesiastes 3.15 states, that which is already has been, that which is to be already is. Right. Well, what we get from the space-time theorems, what we also get from several passages in the Bible, is that time has a beginning and God created time, which means God is not subject to time. However, what we observe about time is that it's linear. It goes forward. We can't reverse it. And uh, this is actually good, as I mentioned, beyond the cosmos, because by being limited, to a single dimension of time, where time cannot be reversed, that is a factor that controls the spread of evil. But once evil no longer is a factor, I believe that God is going to deliver us from being constrained to linear time and move us into an experience of geometric time. Now exactly how that geometric time unfolds, I don't know. But one of the things I do discern from Revelation 21 and 22, when we enter into the new creation, our relationships will no longer be constrained by linear time. And maybe our relationships won't be constrained by any kind of space dimensionality either. I mean, God also created our space dimension, so he's not subject to our space dimensions. And by the way, I leave open the possibility that God has the power to create dimensions that are neither space nor time, uh, but have other uh, capabilities of allowing us to experience a relationship with him. But uh, I can remember when I signed my name in the back of a Gideon Bible, giving my life to Jesus Christ, and ending a brief moment of depression, realizing, hey, my last name is Ross. I'd really love to have a private conversation with the Apostle Paul when I enter the new creation. But with the last name of Ross, I'm going to have to wait at least 10 million years before that's going to happen. There's going to be a lot of people ahead of me in the line. <laughs> But having read Revelation 21 and 22, I realized somehow God's going to give the Apostle Paul a capability to have millions, if not billions, of simultaneous private one-on-one -on -one conversations. And I remember talking to my colleague, Ken Samples, our staff philosopher, and says, Hugh, I'm not so excited about that. I really need my cave time. And I said, well, if time is geometric, you can have all the cave time you want. <laughs> plus have all these possibilities uh, for relationship. He says, okay, I've got to think about that. But that's also something you see in Corinthians. No one can think or imagine how great and wonderful it will be because we're not going to be constrained to the dimensions we have here in this universe. And that, well, exactly how it's going to be, I'm speculating. Uh, but it's going to be a whole lot better than anything we can think or imagine here. So we're going to make this our last question, and if you have further questions, I'm sure that Dr. Ross will be willing to hang out up front and talk to you personally as we break down the chapter, but the last question is in the very back there. Hi. Um, you might answer part of it, so I'm going to ask two, because I had two I wanted to ask. Uh, first off, thank you. You hurt my brain. <laughs> it was fabulous um, in a good way. Um, I think... Two things. When you were talking about ge geometric, when they talk about the new heaven and new her earth, I think maybe that was what you were just talking about. I'm not sure. So I, I have a question about that because it almost sounds like it's some form of a measurement. So I have a question about that, if you could answer that. And my other question was on a more spiritual level in witnessing because uh, Paul says to be bold. How do you find your boldness? Yeah. Either on a plane or wherever. Right. Well, that's what I think is the key to being able to effectively share your faith. We're to be gentle, we're to be respectful, but we're also to be bold. And a lot of people think, well, that sounds like a contradiction. Uh, how can you be bold and gentle and respectful at the same time? And again, practice. If you practice, but a real key to boldness is being confident that you have good reasons. If you're shaky on your reasons, you're going to be thinking, hey, if I share my faith, I'm going to get royally embarrassed. And it's one thing I've noticed about the human condition. We don't like to be embarrassed. But hey, you have to go through some embarrassment to get to a place where you're going to have uh, that courage. 
And so I can remember my early days at the University of Toronto in Caltech, uh, sharing my faith and not doing very well. I got embarrassed royally time and time again, where I realized, you know, these reasons that I thought were great, they're not well enough prepared. I got to go back to the drawing board. That's part of the process, but it does mean that you need to be able to step out boldly right at the beginning. And one of the things I've learned as a pastor in our church, uh, I'm part of a pastoral staff of a church between uh, Caltech and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the headquarters of the Skeptic Society. So you can imagine the kind of people that come to our church. Uh, so, uh, but uh, what I would did is I would take people who are brand new in the faith of Jesus Christ, typically only had given their lives to Jesus Christ a few days ago, and immediately take them out door-to-door -door evangelism. Why? Because they're so new in the Christian faith, they're not even thinking about the fact that they're going to get embarrassed. They're so excited about their new Christian faith, they just jump right out there and they do it. Uh, it's people who have been Christians for a decade or more. Those are the ones that are really difficult to get them to step out and boldly share their faith. But I've got a secret there too. I team them up with a brand new Christian and send them out together. And the new Christian often shames the older Christian and gets them thinking, hey, you know, I got better reasons what they got. <laughs> if they can jump out, I can jump out too. But again, it's a process. Uh, the development of better reasons and therefore greater confidence in your faith is a process. And again, God could have sent the angels. And in one sense, he does. He does have angels working behind the scenes to assist us in our ministry. As it says in Hebrews 13, 2, many of us have entertained angels unawares. So God allows them to assist us, but he doesn't allow them to do the direct ministry. That's our job. We're to do that. But if we do that, he will assist us. As I said, he will work miracles to bring you together with someone that he's prepared in advance. And incidentally, having been a pastor now for more than four decades, it's people who are regularly experiencing those miracles that are growing the most rapidly in their Christian faith. So I see that as one of the most important reasons why we all may be involved in sharing our faith. It has a powerful effect on transforming the spirit within us into the image of Christ. Thank you for that question. Dr. Ross, thank you very much. You're